And rounding out our Commissioner Plenary presentations, I now have the honor to introduce uh, Commissioner Stephen G. Burns, who began his service on the Commission on November 5th, 2014, with a term ending June 30, 2019. Mr. Burns served as the 16th Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission from January 1st, 2015 through January 23rd of this year. Now serving as a commissioner, he continues to be engaged in the work of the agency and in its safety and security mission. Commissioner Burns had a distinguished career in nuclear safety, both at the NRC and internationally. Uh, this may be his 27th regulatory information conference, but, uh, but he missed three while he was in France, he mentioned. Uh, although it is his third as a commissioner of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Immediately prior to rejoining the NRC, Commissioner Burns was the head of legal affairs at the Nuclear Energy Agency of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris from 2012 to 2014. And prior to serving at NEA, Commissioner Burns served as a career employee at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for 33 years from 1978 until 2012. And in this capacity, Commissioner Burns served in a variety of challenging roles, uh, including serving as NRC's General Counsel from May 2009 to April 2012, as the Deputy General Counsel before that, beginning in 1998. And also of note, Commissioner Burns served as the Executive Assistant to former NRC Chairman Ken Carr, and served as the first Director of the Office of Commission Appellate Adjudication. He received the NRC's Distinguished Service Award in 2001 and the Presidential Meritorious Executive Rank Award, both in 1998 and 2008. Commissioner Burns received his Juris Doctorate degree in, with honors in 1978 from the George Washington University here in Washington, D.C., and his Bachelor of Arts degree as magna cum laude uh, in 1975 from Colgate University in Hamilton, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Commissioner Stephen Burns. So I'm not gonna talk about Colgate basketball, but I'm only interested in hockey anyway, and uh, so anyway. So you guys can all worry about the thing. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, Mike. Actually, Mike and I worked together on Chairman Carr's staff. Uh, uh, some time ago, so, and that was uh, a great honor for both of us and a, a great learning experience um, for us as well. Um, I, first, a couple uh, just acknowledgments of staff, and I, I could probably say ditto to a lot of the comments that have already been made, and actually, I kind of like this going last. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I anticipate some of the questions, and I'll say what she said or what he said or something like that at the end. But I, I do want to first offer my congratulations to Christine Savinicki uh, for her designation as chairman in, in January. I, I worked with her as I heard her talked about my career, and, and she talked about hers here at the NRC uh, while in, I was in a very different uh, or in different capacities over an, a number of years. And I've always appreciated her uh, quick wit, her sharp mind, and her strategic viewpoint. Um, we've had a good transition, I think, it's under. Uh, uh, sometimes a little challenging circumstance in, in January, but it, I think it's worked well. And I've, I've asked my uh, former chairman staff and staff to give her and, and her staff support as we do the transition. I think that's that's gone very that's gone very well. And I think that's one of the great things uh, I think about the agency where where we're able able to do that. I also want to take um, uh, my, uh, this opportunity to express my appreciation to senior management of the agency who supported me so well uh, during my two years as, as chairman. Is, you know, at, at the point I was being lured back to the NRC from Paris, you can't believe I did that still, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I really never expected to step into the role of, ch uh, of chairman. Um, but the staff, many of whom, uh, uh, when we were uh, well, I was going to say had a lot more hair on our heads, but uh, looking down at my couple of my colleagues, but or at least mine was a little uh, darker uh, at the time. But s some of these guys, like uh, like Bill and like Vic, uh, Glenn Tracy, um, 
and, and others. You know, I'd work with uh, as we were sort of growing up at the NRC and across the career and learning things and, and applying that. And I, I appreciate their service and, and those of all the senior management and their support, uh, particularly me during the time as, uh, as chairman. Because basically, you know, even though in the chairman capacity, you really have to rely not only on your colleagues uh, on the commission to, to support, you know, to support you where, where our viewpoints align and to when we reach consensus of decisions to go forward and, and uh, but we, particularly on the staff, uh, senior management and line staff as we carry out our safety and security programs. So uh, again, I've, I've, uh, I appreciate that. I also want to acknowledge my personal staff. Uh, as the audience may not be aware, the chairman's office, uh, and this really goes back to the, the time of Chairman Zeck, uh, was structured to be a larger office than an ind individual commissioner's offices. Um, when I took on the extra responsibility of the chairman, I decided not to fully staff up. Um, you know, we had a few more than, than the uh, commissioner's office, but I really wanted I wanted to sort of grow into the role and see what we really needed. And, and the folks I had there, I was really impressed with and, and really stepped up to the bar. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge a few who have not come with me um, up to the, back up to the 18th floor. Um, and, and some of them have computed. First, Claire Kisputis, who's continuing on in, in Chairman Savinicki's office. Claire is, is one of almost what I would call these national assets because of her understanding and knowledge of the budget and uh, administrative processes with the NRC. So I want to thank her. I want to thank Holly Harrington, who was in Office of Public Affairs, but uh, did part-time duty helping me uh, with speech writing. Um, and the speed and skill with which she did that was, was very impressive. And, and lastly, Johari Moore, who was my technical assistant for materials. Uh, she has really had one of the sharp, or has one of the sharpest minds we had in the office, and her advice on our array of issues was, was very valued, and I, I loved her very uh, dry and droll sense of humor and sharp wit. It was a good, good compliment. We, in the Burns family, that, the, the, the you know, humor is important. Um, as, uh, you know, going back to my, I know my grandfather, but I was going to tell a pun, but he would say, probably I'd say two-thirds of a pun, P-U, okay? Yeah. Uh, All right, so that's my joke for the day. Huh. Uh, anyway, uh, but Johari's transitioning on in NSER, expanding her career, and I hope she has a long career with his agency, because I think she's going there. And then, of course, I want to acknowledge the staff that did come back up with me to the, uh, I was going to, to the 18th floor, Steve Baggett, who's also served in the commission in other capacities, Nan Valliere uh, as well, uh, Tracy Stokes, who came to me from the Office of General Counsel, uh, my administrative assistants, Kathleen Blake and Sandy Cianci. I, I really appreciate to continue to work with them. And of course, Jason Zorn, uh, who I had hired into the NRC through the honors program in the Office of General Counsel. Uh, he had wandered outside the agency, and I drew him back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from Pittsburgh uh, to work with me, and he's been a great support and great help uh, to me. So I, I wanted to start out with those thanks, and how are we doing on time? Oh, okay. But uh, when I reflected on what to talk about today, um, actually uh, sort of, I, I don't know whether this is one of these sort of old man moments or what, but uh, if I go back 40 years, 40 years ago, I applied for a job at the NRC. Not this time of year. I think it was, it was probably uh, closer to uh, September time frame. Uh, but the, at the same time, uh, I did reflect on uh, looking what I was doing 40 years ago. So I was in law school, and uh, I was on the George Washington Law Review, and, and I, I wrote an article for the Law Review on Congress and the Office of Technology Assessment. How many of you remember OTA? Yeah, okay, there are a few, few of us there. Uh, it was abolished, I, I think, after in the, in the 1990s or the early 2000s. I can't remember quite, quite when. But the, the idea, when I went back and read my old note, and I'll tell you why I'm mentioning my old note in a minute, is you know, this notion of trying to get better. It was an effort in looking at getting better at science and technology and how it's incorporated in the public policy process. And one can argue about the merits of OTA or, or not. But that sort of realizes, as I've been sort of at 
this even at law school, and this was not, I was a German major, you know, and if you want me to, I can recite a poem for you later, if you'd like, from memory, a Goethe poem, beautiful poem. Um, but, you know, this is not something I really thought I would get into, but I realize now I've been sort of at it about 40 years. Now, why did I mention my note? Well, when I went back to look at it on Hein Online, which is one of these electronic research services, it said I was something like the 50,467th most read person uh, in the Hein Online. So what I'm trying to do is have you guys kind of look it up so I get down to about 49,000 or something <laughs> like that today. Um, but in any event, one of the things I realize, and I, I think come, even coming back to the agency, certainly at my time at NEA, uh, but also as general, in, in the general counsel's office and, and working with tech, the technical staff, working with the legal staff, is this thinking about what I talked about last year called the regulatory craft. And I'm not going to repeat the speech I gave last year, but maybe, maybe I can build upon it in, in some uh, small way. Um, we talked a lot this morning, uh, and I think appropriately so, sort of at the pivot point we may be at, uh, at as an agency, having gone through the, the project, aim, um, uh, project AIM process, which again, uh, and I, you know, I compliment those, both on the staff and Chairman Farland and the other commissioners, uh, for encouraging that process in 2014, particularly as a way of, for us to take our, our own destiny in our hands to the extent that we can. Uh, you know, still with you know, the oversight of the Congress, the discipline you have through the budgetary process through the executive branch, but something that says we let us think about what makes sense going forward. And we've gone a, a, a far way with that. Um, but what are the, you know, when we come through AIM and we, there were particular projects and now, you know, what we talk about is a sustainability and how we move on from it, uh, which means, you know, we've gotten through the Things like uh, you know, we're redesigned some processes. We've I think recentered some processes. Vic talked about backfitting, for example. Uh, we've done those types of things. We've cut back on things like perhaps the excessive use of toner cartridges and things like that. Those <laughs> things can, as we all know, those things can say, you know, yeah, you need to be in that business in terms of right. So you, you can cut those kinds of costs, but. I think there's still something to be said about what we need to do is continually focus on what it means to be a regulator. And as I say, I've talked about the regulatory craft in, in some past speeches. Um, but ultimately, it's about how our people sort of understand and work through the regulatory process. I think that's at the essence, and I think that's a lot of what I think we're focused on as an agency. I think that's what you heard, uh, particularly in, in, in Vic, in a number of the details that Vic was talking about in terms of where we need to focus. So, and it's not an easy task. Uh, we don't walk into this building or the, building across, the buildings across the street becoming sort of effective regulators. Um, you know, we, we, we come out of different disciplines. I came out of law school. We have people come out of the nuclear navy, out of engineering schools, uh, may, maybe have had some industry or other types of experience coming in, and you just don't sit them down and say, "Do it." I actually had an attorney once, uh, um, and I, I realize this is in the interest of an, uh, a uh, good work environment. He says, "I'm using this as a metaphor." I could have smacked him upside the head because. What he did, he had a young, there was a, a young attorney came work for me. She had been my summer clerk. She comes into the office her first week or sec, second week. He dumped something on the desk. They said, oh, here, give me this by the end of the day. No, nobody really knew it. I found out about this and was absolutely appalled because though she had been at the NRC before, she really wasn't into the, in, in, if you will, into the system yet. Uh, really having that understanding, what's your role? You come out of law school, well, we're going to go do some law. Or we know we're going to sit here and talk about what the law is. But then you have to realize you've got to interact with that client, that client who may be that technical expert. He might be that office director. He might be that peer that's the, the project manager. Uh, it might be you're going to a meeting with somebody from, you know, with 
people from the outside, where you have NGOs, where we have licensees who are all engaged. So it's not just a matter of showing up and you're here and you've got to do the work. You've got to be, you know, you've got to be inculcated in terms of what the dynamic is, what, what it is about our job and how we do it and how we can, how we can do it well. So before I uh, go on about what that is, is what, what I think we can focus on, what I, one of the things I think for us as we come into the agency, and here I'm, uh, I'm going to perhaps t drift from sort of the technical realm that the agency primarily works in, but we have to understand the context, and maybe that's, that's this intersection of law and technology. I know uh, Chairman Diaz used to talk about that. Uh, a lot, and I, I think there's a lot to that. So it's the, this integration, if you will, of the science, of the engineering, but also the framework, that's the institutional, the legal framework that we work in. And under, having us understand that, and having new f uh, folks here at the NRC, and actually a continual reminder for those of us who have been around and continue to work in the area, I think is, is very important. And as we know, within our framework, our, the Hallmark is the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. And while we have interesting debates about what it means, ultimately we come down that, that concept, that very, in effect, simple or, 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 or deceivingly simple phrase, adequate protection, and what it means in, in, in a particular context, in a particular regulation, in a, uh, in a pit, in the particular environment that we regulate in. And of course, seeking that, we're going to have healthy debates. We're going to have folks, um, you know, at one level, you know, you're concerned about uh, whether you, you've gone too far, whether you've not gone far enough. Those are, are the debates that, that we have. That's, that's the, that's the interesting thing. And, and all, what common sense, I think, dictates and, and understanding in the context of what we have in, under the Atomic Energy Act is there is no such thing, really, as zero risk. And, and that's not what we should attend to as regulators or attempt to make as an unobtainable goal. We have to get that mentality infused in those we work with, and to ensure that we make that understood in terms of those we regulate and those we are obligated uh, to regulate for, to protect the American public. So uh, what I might turn to is perhaps a little bit of law. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it nuclear law. Um, and one thing um, I would say is, uh, if you, you, you beg my indulgence, is perhaps the starting point for this, even for us here in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and I would say, of course, because we are a federal agency, the starting point's the U.S. Constitution. So why am I talking about the Constitution here? What does that have to do with the regulation of nuclear safety? And I think a lot, as it turns out. I'll quote James Madison. He's not a nuclear engineer. But James Madison writes in Federalist Number 51, that great collection of documents that talk about our Constitution. Madison writes, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, let's say people over people, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. And that's that interesting dynamic, I think Madison and others do, as they wrote about in the, in the defense or, or, or in the advocacy for the Constitution. So his, out, his statement outlines in broad terms what the Supreme Court later has articulated as the limited powers of the federal government on the Constitution. And the court described this construct as the federal government is acknowledged by all to be one of enumerated powers. That is, rather than granting general authority to perform all the conceivable functions of government, the Constitution lists or enumerates the federal government's powers. And it's, the Constitution's express conferral of powers, some powers, makes it clear that it does not grant others. And the federal government can only exercise the powers granted to it. 
So if we look at that construct a slightly different way, a basic premise of our entire system of government is that citizens or associations of citizens or organizations that they form get the benefit of the doubt when it comes to government action. Such a notion is reflected, for example, in the backfit rule, I would argue, which prescribes that the agency must undertake an analytical process and justify its position before imposing new requirements on the regulated. It's also reflected in the legal structure of our, our, of our, our country and our government, which under the Administrative Procedure Act prescribes specific standards for agencies of government to apply before imposing new burdens on society. Now, sometimes this framework can seem like an onerous impediment to agency action. However, truth be told, it is intended to be an impediment and sometimes difficult by design. So as individual citizens, we recognize the value of this impediment when it comes to things like our rights under the Fifth Amendment, not to have property seized by the government uh, arbitrarily, or in the limits on the taxation authority of the IRS, or the right not to be detained by police without cause. And it may be harder to take these limits to in mind sometimes when it comes to uh, more civil authorities and, and from the perspective of government regulation in area. But it's necessary, I think, to remind ourselves of it from time to time. So that leads us to the authorities of the NRC. Supreme Court has explained that time and time again that a regulatory agency operates solely within the authorities given to it by the Congress. And for the NRC, that is primarily the Atomic Energy Act and, and a few other things along the way, the Energy Reorganization Act and some others. And while our authority under the statute is broad and permits a significant exercise of discretion by the agency, it's not unbounded. As I alluded to earlier, I think the starting point of all this inquiry is our mandate that the NRC provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection. And it's not an absolute assurance, again, or 100% expectation of absence of risks. So why is that important when it comes to understanding how to be a regulator? Well, I think every decision that we make must be viewed through this lens. And an essential function of the NRC is to determine how much risk is acceptable and when establishing regulatory requirements. When it drafted the Atomic Energy Act, the Congress was trying to establish a balance between establishing a strong regulatory framework for an emerging industry using novel technology, while at the same time not stifling its development. The world's evolved, and the promotional and regulatory organizations within the Atomic Energy Commission that were established at the time were broken apart for good reason. But it's important to remind ourselves that peaceable uses of atomic energy for, quote, the maximum contribution to the general welfare continues to be the policy expressed in the, in the Atomic Energy Act. So let's back up to what it means to become a regulator. Within those general principles I've said, I think there are probably three things we need to focus on in an agency. And I, th I think we are, and I think those are areas where I think we need to continue to focus. One is training and development. I mentioned my uh, young colleague who uh, started out and was being, you know, basically thrown, you know, rewrite the Atomic Energy Act on the first day of work, something like that. <laughs> I think, so that's training and oversight. I think it's management oversight, management leadership, and stakeholder engagement. Let me briefly address each of those. So as I said, our, our staff often come from different pipelines, nuclear Navy, industry, university, law schools, other schools. They came in our doors knowing the principles of engineering and science, of law. But we don't necessarily know to be a regulator. So part of our task here as you know, senior officials in the agency, as managers, as experienced staff, is to help that process along. Some of it is done, I think, by training. Some, you know, what you go through, how, you, how in effect, the, if you will, the tribal lore the culture is transmitted. Um, some of it is by example. It's by the example of us as commissioners, of senior management. It is of peers. It is the ability to engage with each other um, as uh, in peers. It is those sort of support groups within, within your cohort. It is, and this is one of the things I've always thought has been a strength of, uh, of NRC, it is this willingness to look across 
disciplines. You know, we, we get a lot of, uh, over the years, I probably, if I had collected all the lawyer jokes and my engineer jokes, I'd probably have a book, I could probably publish a book. But part of that comes out of the camaraderie that we develop and knowing that we are part of a mutual support system. And that's what's important, and that's what's important for us to continue uh, to engage with in this agency. Vic touched on it in terms of some of the uh, things I think the staff wants to try to do. You know, we recognize in terms of, uh, you know, the, the sort of the feedback or the temperature taking we get from some of the surveys that helps us go on and helps us become a tighter-knit organization to address those issues where some people may not feel. Uh, th that they have that capacity or, th or that engagement uh, or, or acceptability to, to raise issues and all. And that's something we have to, to keep, working, keep working at. And we have to, it is within that sense, is by, again, by example uh, and by, uh, by coaching and all, is this finding that and it, it is, we've had a lot of grail quests here today, and I've used in other speeches, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm like Percival, you know, on the, on the grail quest. But it is, I think, a quest of that, that trying to find either that sweet spot in developing how do we look at that. Uh, we engage it, we raise the issues, ultimately we have to resolve the issues, but that's what we need to inculcate into our staff. So that's part of our training. And it is, again, as I say, it's formal and informal. Management oversight, it, it says without saying. We have to, as, as senior leadership, both the, the commission, the senior leadership, the offices, we have, and, and down to the first line supervisors, in many ways I think have the most difficult task. We have to keep unculcating that culture of that looks at how do we find optimal, the optimal solutions? How do we assure that we tease out what's important from what just may be uh, a distraction in terms of safety issues? Um, uh, you know, NRC is often, and I sort of cringe sometimes, we're talked about as the gold standard. Um, but what I think NRC needs to do is always seek to achieve highest standards of performance, but do so with a balanced perspective on the significance of activities and the overall context of our regulatory responsibility and the overarching objective to be focused on the right things. And though that is a journey, that is an ongoing quest. And management can reinforce those principles through day-to-day -day oversight, engagements with the staff and, it, and, and, and agency operations, engagement with those who have an interest in what we do outside the agency, whether it's licensees, whether it's governmental officials, whether it's members of the public, NGOs, the press, the media. And we have to do it not just by proclamation, but by practice and have to implement it that way. And that's where management, I think, has the burden. And finally, what I would uh, um, say, and I, I mentioned this again, it is, this is not solely an internal reflection or journey. It is a quest on which we engage with others along the road. And if you read any of those old stories, and I had, to, as a German major, I actually had to read some of the old things. So those knights who went out didn't just talk to themselves. <laughs> they met interesting people. Sometimes you weren't quite sure who they were on the way, and they turned out to be magicians and uh, and kings and uh, uh, pretty women sometimes for some of these nights um, um, along the way. But what that says is it really is about engagement. It's about engagement with the, with the industry. It's engagement with, with folks in the NGO community, with the general public that lives near the plants, with the press, with the Congress, with state officials, with local officials. And that's, again, something we have to work at, uh, I think, at all, all the time. And that, it, what that emphasizes to me is what I've said across the years. And that means, basically, we are independent, but we are not isolated. And that, for me, is the, the greatest thing or objective I think we can achieve there. So I, I've tried to scratch the surface here in, in the meanderings of my, these thoughts is, you know, uh, quote Mark Twain, if I had had more time, I would have written a shorter speech or paraphrase Mark Twain. 
Um, but so I come back again. So I think we have to recognize NRC can't operate in a vacuum, and it shouldn't do so. That's not only bad practice, but it's inconsistent with the law, which requires us to engage through rulemaking notices. We have a public hearing process. We go beyond that in terms of trying to do engagement. And I know some of my international colleagues, I'm actually very interested, the, I remember studying, for example, the, the changes in the French law and, and the uh, Transparency Act 2006 and the idea there to form particularly the, the um, uh, public information or the local information committees. So there are different practices around the world I think we can look at and, and learn from. So that's that engagement. Um, again, we can't assume just because folks come in the door and we need that technical talent that we know how to be regulators when we come in. So we need to work at that. And finally, I think I'll leave you with, it's hard. It's hard being the regulator. But I don't ask for any sympathy for that or it being hard. It's hard by design. It's because of the framework we work into. And sometimes it's harder th than others. I've heard some of these, these questions. And that gets at, I think, the point I'm trying to make about engagement and also thinking about what really makes sense in terms of safety, of security, and the viability of the regulatory program. So there are competing factors, tensions, pressures to reach the right decision at the end of the day. You out there hold us to that standard as well you should. And we owe it to you, we owe it to the American people to judiciously exercise our authority, keeping safety, keeping security at the front and first in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Burns. Uh, we have time for a couple quick questions. Uh, so the first one is, at a time when states like New York and Illinois are being asked to help uh, ensure the competitiveness of nuclear power as a source of, of generation, should more weight be given to broadly held state interests under the Constitution, such as uh, eliminating safe store and requiring immediate dismantlement for closed plants? Well, I think those are decisions, this is the, often the, the interesting thing, and I've come across in, in the last couple of years in, in terms of some of my travels, is some of those decisions are really decisions of engagement outside the NRC's ken. And, and what that, I, I think that means is what we are, have to be focused on is focused on the technical aspects of what we do and the safety aspects. And we have to be upfront about, you know, upfront about that. This is what it means from, us, from our standpoint, best on, based on the best information we know, is to what, um, uh, what the standard should be. Questions about, you know, um, fuel storage, whether you support um, uh, basically uh, efforts to uh, help uh, nuclear generation that might otherwise shut down, timing of say so. A lot of those things are engagements, I think, within uh, either in the local, in local areas uh, or, or regionally or national things that, that really are not primarily the NRC, NRC. And so I think what we have to do is, is keep, you know, on, you know, on task with respect to honest assessment of what we think the technical risks are and move from there. Okay. And uh, last question. Is there a simple way to open and update the Atomic Energy Act to address some outdated aspects such as foreign ownership and operation without opening up the entire act to review and mischief? No. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. No. I, I might even say, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Commissioner Burns, right, thank, thank you. you very much.